everyone. So welcome to the Society of Libyan Studies annual lecture. I'm Corazan Fennec, the director of the Society. Um, just to introduce you a little bit to the Society and what we're about. The Society for Libyan Studies is a British learned society and charity which was sponsored by the British Academy. It was established in 1969 to foster links between British and Libyan scholars in a wide range of fields, including archaeology, history, geography, the natural sciences and linguistic, linguistics. Uh, but we've significantly expanded our remit in recent years to focus on facilitating UK research in the broader humanities and social sciences um, across the North African region. So Libya, Tunisia, Algeria, Morocco, Egypt, Niger, Mali, Chad and Sudan. The Society supports UK and North African researchers, both at PhD level and academics, to conduct primary research in these countries through our grant schemes. And we also provide platforms for sharing and publishing world leading research on North Africa through our event series, uh, through our journal Libyan Studies and our various publication series, including our popular imprint, Silphium. Uh, the Society is committed to making research on North Africa accessible to all. Uh, we're currently putting our very rich archaeological archives on Libya's history and heritage uh, online. Uh, and many of our publications are now available to all um, as fully open access publications, which can be downloaded from our website. And I'm very delighted to announce uh, the publication of a new book, Building the Countryside, Rural Architecture and Settlement in Tripolitania during the Roman and Late Antique Periods by Dr. Nicole Sheldrick of the University of Leicester. Uh, this book, which is the first analysis of Tripolitania's rural landscapes in antiquity, is available for free as an open access ebook, which you can download from our website. But it's also available to purchase as a hard copy for £30 for members or £40 for non members. This is, I think, a great stocking filler uh, for those of you interested in Libya's heritage, or indeed as a present to yourself to while away those long winter nights. Um, now a little bit about where we are right now. As a small learned society, we do a huge amount on a very small income. And like many charities and learned societies at the moment, this is a very difficult time for us, which has been exacerbated by the pandemic. Our funding, which comes primarily from the public purse, um, from the government via the British Academy, uh, is increasingly under threat. And so I wanted to take this moment at our annual lecture to thank all of our members and donors for your continued support. Your subscriptions, your donations, legacies are fundamental to ensuring the future of the society and its activities. And we're very, very grateful for your continued support, especially throughout the pandemic. Um, at the moment, we're actively looking for sponsors to support named lectures, grants, and other of our activities. And so if this is something that might be of interest to you, uh, please do get in touch with me or our treasurer, Oliver Kimberley. And of course, if you're not already a member, I invite you to join the Society for the very reasonable sum of £30, for which you would receive, among other benefits, a copy of our journal, Libyan Studies, access to our library collections at SOAS, access to our archive at the University of Leicester, and significant reductions on our publications. Uh, but that's enough of a pitch for the Society. Let me turn to the business of today. And I'm really delighted to introduce our annual lecture speaker, Professor James McDougall who is Professor of Modern and Contemporary History at the University of Oxford and a Fellow at Trinity College. His research lie um, in North Africa, particularly in Algeria, but go much more broadly to that to cover the entirety of the Mediterranean Middle East in, um, from the Ottoman and modern periods. Uh, Professor McDougall studied modern languages at St Andrews and then did his PhD at uh, the University of Oxford, where he was subsequently a junior research fellow at St Anthony's College, before moving to the States to become an ancient his, uh, assistant professor of history at Princeton University. He then came back to the UK as lecturer in African history at SOAS before returning to Oxford in 2009. Uh, many of you will know his first monograph, uh, History and the Culture of Nationalism in Algeria, which was published by Cambridge University Press in 2006, and is an extremely important study of the intersection of Islamic modernism and nationalism in colonial Algeria and the role that history played within that. Uh, so on a personal note, this was a book that was very formative for me as a PhD student working on ancient North Africa. Uh, his widely acclaimed second monograph, History of Algeria, was published by Cambridge University Press in 2017 and presents a history of the country from the Ottoman conquest to the Arab Spring and won the British Kuwait Friendship Society Book Prize amongst other accolades. 
Uh, Professor McDougall is currently working on two books, uh, An Empire in Fragments, a book on the everyday life of French colonialism in Africa, um, and Worlds of Islam, How Being Muslim Became Modern, which aims to tell the global story of Muslim history for a wider audience. Uh, but today, uh, Professor McDougall is returning to, to North Africa, um, and without further ado, I will hand over to him to present his lecture titled Always on the Edge, the Spaces of North African History. Over to you. Um, well, thank you very much, uh, Chorus, for the very generous uh, introduction. Um, I'm not sure I dare say anything after that. It's one of those introductions that makes the, sort of the bar kind of high um, in terms of expectations. Um, uh, thank you very much to uh, the Society for the invitation, to Nicola Munyai for setting this up, to Pauline and Susan for the uh, work in the background, and of course for introducing us this evening. Uh, and thank you to everybody who's joining us uh, online. Uh, I'm sorry, obviously, that we can't actually see each other, uh, in particular that I can't see you, uh, and that we uh, can't hang out and have drinks in the British Academy, which would have been nice. Um, but it's great that nonetheless that uh, we can uh, be together at least virtually uh, and thank you all for turning up uh, on this evening uh, from wherever you are in the world. Let's start with a story from the archives. In this case two provincial archives in France already to start slightly out of the way in Aix-en-Provence and Chambéry where these documents are located. The story is of an Algerian soldier, Belkassim ben Hedj Yahim, the unusual name might suggest that he was a Jewish convert to Islam, though in French-occupied Algeria in the 1870s, after the Crémieux decree had given citizenship to Algerian Jews in civilian ruled territory, it's not obvious that crossing that communal boundary would have been in his interests. He'd crossed another boundary of sorts, although this was a step that many North African men would take, by signing up to join the French army. And so it was that in the summer of 1883, he found himself, presumably having travelled by sea, with the French forces campaigning in West Africa along the Niger River at Kayes in what's now Western Mali. From there, he deserted his post, wanting to go home, having had enough of French service, and he took the most direct route to do so, along the river to Timbuktu and then north across the Sahara. Having survived the crossing of the desert, he arrived near Tiaretz in Western Algeria and was promptly arrested for desertion. He was sentenced to five years hard labour and shows up in the historical record in 1888, at what should have been almost the end of his sentence as an inmate at the Pontenu Fortress, the French Navy's prison at Brest on the Atlantic coast of Brittany. He'd already been incarcerated apparently in Ariège down in the Pyrenees, which accounts for the wiggle in the uh, grey, the very, very approximate grey line there uh, that is intended to mark his likely approximate itinerary across these spaces. By the time the colonial office at the Navy Ministry in Paris started listening to Belkassim's story about crossing the Sahara, which he told to the prison warder, and which in the 1880s was something they were anxious to know more about, the prison authorities, disbelieving him, had sent him back to Algeria to finish his sentence, pulling up vines in the countryside around Mascara in the campaign to eradicate phylloxera from the Algerian vineyards. He would die there in the military hospital in March 1889. What can the remarkable itinerary of Tirayar Belkassim Yakim tell us about the spaces of North African history? He moved across geographies, the plains and towns of Algeria and Sahelian West Africa, the Sahara, the Mediterranean and metropolitan France, whose interrelationships were being disrupted and recomposed by the spread and consolidation of late 19th century imperialism, a process in which he was himself literally a foot soldier. When he tried to escape it into the desert and out of its reach, it was only to land back in its claws as soon as he got anywhere close to home. He moved through institutional spaces, the army and the barracks, the prison and the labour battalion, the colonial vineyard, the colonial bureaucracy, the military hospital, and eventually, we presume, the confessionally Muslim cemetery of a jurisdictionally French town that were all loci of rapid and often highly coercive change. At the same time, his remarkable escape attempt was an evasion, albeit a temporary one, not only from colonial service and discipline, but from an increasingly imperialized geography into a much older network of patterns of space and movement that ran between Sahelian, Saharan and Mediterranean Africa. The connections between these might have been exotic and mysterious to Europeans intent on unlocking what they still imagined to be the golden interior of Africa, but they'd been again very literally the stock in trade of North African populations for many centuries. <laughs> 
They were part of an older and persistent set of historical connections that predated even the arrival of Islam, but that had since the Mediterranean, that, but that since the medieval period had incorporated Northwest Africa into a Muslim ecumeny. On a world historical scale, this was an important part of and an extension of the intercommunicating zone of the Afro-Asian world, to borrow a term from uh, Marshall Hudson and uh, John Mc William McNeil. The intercommunicating zone of the Afro-Eurasian world, stretching from the Atlantic to the Pacific across the Indian Ocean. Within North Africa, on a regional and micro-level scale, it created highly localized sacred spaces and dense networks of shared knowledge, practice, and sociability between them. Trade and pilgrimage routes that both crossed the desert and intersected with Mediterranean shipping were well established and enduring, adapting to the changes of the 19th century perhaps more than they were displaced by them. They replicated and then framed, in spatial terms, systems of social solidarity, connection, and worldview embedded in the region's culture and landscape that would often endure despite the disruptions of imperialism. This was the spatial world of other earlier travelers, like Ahmed ibn Tawar and Janna Ashinkiti, the account of whose pilgrimage from Tashit in the southwestern corner of the Sahara to Mecca in 1829-31, just as European imperialism was beginning to encroach on this world, was published by H.T. Norris in 1977. Warmly received by the new French rulers of Algiers when his ship put in there on his way home from the Hejaz, Ahmed was able politely to fend off their not disinterested inquiries about his home region and left for Gibraltar en route back to what's now Mauritania with his large collection of books acquired in Tunis intact. His ideological universe, in which God and his saints were ineffably sovereign, whatever confusions might reign on earth, was equally able to withstand the intrusions of Europe. As I've argued, at least even for the case of Algeria, that most intensive example of settler colonialism, and notwithstanding the very severe transformations wrought in other dimensions of political, socio-economic, and even religious and cultural life, the colonial state and colonial society were sometimes only a fairly thin overlay across these deeper and enduring structural continuities across time and space. Thinking about North African history in spatial terms and over this kind of long durée is nothing new, and I'm not making any grand claims in this lecture to be introducing a new spatial turn to the history of the Maghreb. It's striking, in fact, how much of the best scholarship on the region has long taken space as a central concern. It was centrally productive to Jacques Berck's work as long ago as Le Maghreb Bonte de Guerre in 1962, with its acute pen portraits of the Algiers Marine Quarter, Tunis and Fez, as well as of the countryside, and in his interest in local sources like the Nawazil, the compendium, compendium of Islamic legal opinions from Mazuna that featured in his L'Intérieur du Maghreb in 1978, and that have recently been studied in greater depth by Elise Vauguet. One of Pierre Bourdieu's most striking early interventions though one whose structuralist framework he would later move away from, was, of course, his study of the simultaneously material and symbolic space of the Kabyle House. A colonial era tradition of Maghreb urban history that alongside contemporary scholarship on Syria originated the theory of the so-called Islamic city has long been replaced, of course, in, uh, particularly in work on our region, by more subtle and critical work, beginning with Janet Abulurod's work on colonial urban planning in Morocco and running through pioneering social studies in social and urban history by David Prohaska, Zainab Celik, and Julia Clancy Smith and others, to the classic article by Omar Kalye on the cafe in Algiers, Isabel Gongo's study of Ottoman Algerian urban history, Emily Gottrek's book on Marrakesh that's part of a wave of important new work on Maghrebi Jewish history, including work on Oran by Joshua Schreier, on Morocco by Jessica Marglin, on the Northern Sahara by Sarah Stein, and work in ethnomusicology and the history of North African music and radio by Bouzien Dwedi, Hej Miliani, Jonathan Glasser, Richard Jankowski, Tamara Turner, and Chris Silva, that often has important spatial dimensions. The critical bibliography on the countryside, cities and their hinterlands, the relationship between states and societies, tribes and cities, peasants and urbanization, all the way from antiquity up to the late 20th century, is much too huge to summarize, as of course is the volume of archaeological work done by North African scholars and their European colleagues over many years, including of course that done by members of the Society for Libyan Studies and published under the auspices of the society, thinking in particular of work by uh, David Mattingly and his team uh, of Andy Wilson and other colleagues. In fact, I think the society had a great example of some of the most recent research on North African micro-regional urbanism and antiquity, for instance, from Paul Scheding only last month. On the period of the 19th century, with which I began, 
An important trend, especially in French scholarship on the history of colonial geography and science in North and West Africa, led by Hélène Delay, Isabelle Surin, and Camille Lefebvre, has recently made important contributions to thinking about space, especially in what are conventionally seen as the yet more peripheral regions between Mediterranean Africa and the West African Sahel, those spaces uh, that Chloris was telling us about uh, the society's uh, expansion of interest in uh, earlier. And even more recent work by Annie Clacroix and Arthur Asheraf for the 19th and 20th centuries and by Ismail Washout for an earlier period have looked at the connections and also the frictions and separations that communications technologies from manuscript to telegraph to newsprint and radio have wrought on localities and their relations to places nearby and far away. So with that in mind, what I'm interested in this evening is more in the way of historiographical survey than a report of new research, a few large scale observations rather than a particular argument. But I do want to draw attention to the extent to which thinking about space in North Africa has been especially productive and especially fertile ground for historiography over a relatively long period of time. And what's striking is the extent to which uh, this recent research in all its micro level detail has really uh, revised, uh, revived, uh, transformed uh, a much older tradition of work. Uh, that had often, uh, especially from the French colonial period onwards, taken thinking about the relationship between geography and history, space and population in the Maghreb in a, in a very different direction uh, and produced uh, a much older and more simplistic set of narratives, although ones with which in some respects were still living. In some ways, the body of critical scholarship on North African history that I just outlined and that's emerged over the past half century stands against a longer tradition in which Maghreb history had been unduly overdetermined in many of the ways it was written about, at least since the 19th century, by too much of a focus on the physical geographies over which it played out. And by overly deterministic conceptions, mostly ones devised from a European perspective, both of that geography and of its relation to continuity and change. North Africa has often been seen, most starkly and prejudicially, in the French colonial era scholarship epitomized by Emile Félix Gautier, as a passive corridor between seas of water and sand, through which successive waves of colonizers simply passed, a tenacious image that's still sometimes uh, encountered in uh, uh, relatively uh, shorthand accounts of the region. For much of its past, much of its past, especially as outsiders have seen it, North Africa's place in the world and in world history has been marginal by this definition, and its geography on the edge of Africa, the periphery of the Middle East, and the doorstep of Europe, caught narrowly between the rim of the Sahara and the wrong side of the Mediterranean has too often served as an easy image to consign it to an antechamber of history. We can see the effects of this even now in some of the more egregiously ignorant commentary that's allowed to pass for opinion in some of the European and American press and political punditry that occasionally uh, takes aim at the region. As when a few years ago it was suggested that the gravest threat to the European Union's stability was really to be found in an impending migratory invasion from an allegedly chronically unstable Algeria. When more recently, a spike in tensions between Algeria and Morocco only a couple of months ago was attributed in uh, one opinion piece in American newspapers uh, to Al Algeria allegedly being a Russian pawn in the region and in the more generalized endemic inability to understand either Tunisia or Libya outside of the equally oversimplified paradigms of embattled democratic bridgehead or intrinsically failed state. These are still, in some European and American imaginaries, places where history can only meaningfully be enacted from outside, despite their peoples having persistently and often heroically demonstrated quite otherwise in ways that ought to have been hard to ignore, at least since the middle of the last century. More positive versions of North Africa too, when seen less as an edge or a periphery than as a junction, a crossroads or a hinge between the Arab world and Africa, Africa and Europe, Europe and Islam, have also been problematic. Placing the Maghreb as a central articulating point geopolitically and intellectually situated on a Mediterranean frontier, running through history from the Habsburgs and the Ottomans to Frontex and Daesh, or even more, even in the more helpful terms of the Tunisian philosopher and historian Mohamed Talbi as a privileged location in what he would wish to be a dialogue of civilizations, tends to end up by reiterating the habitual image of a conflictual fault line. That this too is part of the reality of the region's history and perhaps especially of its contemporary situation is not in doubt. It's especially sharply visible in our own time in the border fences at Ceuta and Melilla and in the graveyards in southern Tunisia, where the unidentified bodies of Haraga, migrants drowned trying to make the crossing into Europe and washed up by the current on the beaches near Sfax or Zarzis 
are buried by number because no one knows their names. The Maghreb's European border zone has indeed become a flashpoint in an emerging 21st century history of accentuated, often racialized borderings of space, one accentuated now by the Libyan civil war, economic crisis in Tunisia, and of course, the COVID pandemic. But it is one of several such recently sharpened frontiers, like the fences between Poland and Ukraine, Hungary and Serbia, Gaza and Israel, the United States and Mexico. To naturalize such a frontier crisis as merely the latest iteration of an unchanging history of civilizational division across the Western Mediterranean would be lazy in the extreme. And anyway, no one believes in the parenthesis anymore. There's no doubt, of course, that geography has always been centrally related in North Africa as anywhere else to history, ecology, to population, topography, to politics. And it's still important to begin any long-term large-scale historical understanding of the region by paying attention to the variety of its localized ecologies and the relations between them. Maritime currents, prevailing winds and seaborne trade routes, as well as the ease or difficulty of cultivation and communication over land, along river valleys, across plains, through mountains, which changed, of course, with the seasons, not only affected relations between our region and its contingent worlds of the Atlantic, the Mediterranean, the Middle East, and Africa south of the Sahara. They also affected the connections between the different areas of what we call North Africa or the Maghreb, however we might define it, that is, relations between different areas within the region, affecting the relative integration or fragmentation of the region itself, and indeed changing what it means to talk about it as an historical region over time. As Brent Shaw demonstrated now 16 years ago, it's helpful, especially for antiquity and up to the 7th or 8th centuries, to conceptualise North Africa as a series of insular environments, whose relation to each other and to the Mediterranean and Saharan oceanic worlds in which they sat could be very changeable across both time and space. The incorporation of Cyrenaica and the Eastern Maghreb, today's Tunisia and Eastern Algeria, uh, and of course uh, Eastern Libya, into Greek, Phoenician and then Roman Mediterranean connectivities was very intense. But the westernmost province of the Roman Empire, in Mauritania Tingitana, today's northwest corner of Morocco, was off the map of the Roman Mediterranean, as Shaw puts it, even compared to very distant and much less Mediterranean places like Britannia or Germania. Isolated from its provincial neighbours to the east, Mauritania Caesariensis and Africa Proconsularis, Mauritania Tingitana, centred on Volubilis, whose site in the Harb Plain lies today west of Fez, near the sanctuary town of Moliadris, was, in Shaw's terms, an extreme land, almost beyond the limits of what we might call Mediterranean imagination. The lack of evidence for any Roman era connection overland between Wolubilis and the westernmost outposts of Mauritania Caesariensis at modern Lalemagnia on the Moroccan Algerian border is in stark contrast with the later importance in the medieval period of the connection through the Taza Gap between Fez and Samson that would become a crucial strategic location for medieval state building in the area under a number of uh, Islamic dynasties. By the time Ibn Khaldun was reflecting on the dynamics of history as driven by the relationship between tribal solidarity and dynastic succession, the nomadic plain and the sedentary city in the 14th century, the relationships of geography to history had clearly changed. It was medieval Arab geography that came up with the image used by Shaw of North Africa as an island or a peninsula or a series of islands, Jazirat al-Maghrib, again, of course, as seen from some other imperial center, this one further east. But the region's most important princely cities were by this stage interior, not coastal, and internal dynamics of religious, cultural, political and economic relations between mountain, plain and city across the region from east to west had supplanted its insular fragmentation in a world centred on the northern Mediterranean. Holding the whole space together politically, of course, was beyond anyone's dynastic power for very long. Ibn Khaldun's Maghreb and the fears for his own personal safety that, so the story goes, uh, had him hiding out in a cave at Kala'at Bani Salama while composing his famous Muqaddama or introduction to his universal history, was the product of the breakdown of the 12th century Almohad's universal uh, conquest state into territorially discrete, discrete successor polities. But what's important here is not so much the familiar sequence of integration and fragmentation, or the ebb and flow of successive tides of conquerors across space seen as static, much as it might look that way when contemplating the view of rocks, hills and plains that opens out in front of what's reputed to have been Ibn Khaldun's cave. Space itself, as the product of the interaction of physical geography with human agency, as something embodied and experienced, was of course never stable. What in antiquity was at the limes, the limit, the edge of things, like Volubilis or like Timgad, 
the Roman military colony sited north of the Ores Mountains in today's eastern Algeria, a prosperous statement of Roman permanence between the 2nd and 5th centuries, changed in significance over time. How such spaces were inhabited, imagined, and connected to others through embodied practice, the forms of the built environment, and the movements of people, goods, and ideas and beliefs, what, in other words, constituted them as spaces situated in human history, rather than as merely features located in geology and geography, was mobile over time. Tim Gadd and Willibulus in the second century, like Suter and Melia today, were edges of larger political and economic formations, but also centers in their own right, whose inhabitants imagined and practiced in their worldviews, their built and social environment and their locality, ways of life that were both rooted in place and connected to a larger cultural and historical universe. As both the larger contexts and the local conditions shifted over time, so such spaces expanded or contracted, were relocated or had walls built around them, fell into ruin or disappeared. People, though, would continue to remake them in similar ways and over a very long span of time. Imagined connections to other geographies would be continually appropriated to create meaning for localized, apparently peripheral social or economic spaces. Thus, to jump to the opposite end of our chronology in the 1990s, in the down at heel Algiers suburb of Boufrezier, the local gangster boss come Islamist kingpin was known locally, apparently, as Napoli from his well known dream of remaking himself by emigrating to Naples. In a more reverent idiom, Saintly figures from Islamic history, especially the famous 12th century Muslim saint Sidi Abdul Qadir al Jilani of Baghdad, have innumerable maqams, local monuments, notionally to mark their passing by, anchoring their universal sanctity in local topography. In more places across the Maghreb countryside than anyone seriously thinks any of them can really have visited, except, of course, by miraculous means. More prosaically, there are Cafe de France in North Africa, just as there are New York diners in provincial towns across Britain. In contrast, if unsurprisingly, much of the region's political history, especially in the 19th and 20th centuries, has been one of successive persistent efforts at territorializing space, fixing its parameters and fixing people in it. Settler colonialism, of course, was a supreme example of this, but so were the centralizing state building programs of 19th century rulers in Tunisia and Morocco, and if less effectively, especially after the, occupant, the Ot Ottoman reoccupation of Tripoli in the 1830s, in Libya too. That this period coincides with the emergence of modern geography is of course not accidental. Even understanding something as fluid, unfixed and seasonally variable as intra and trans-Saharan mobility and exchange became for modern forms of knowledge a matter of drawing straight lines on two-dimensional maps. But the business of organizing space so as to locate human and material resources in it, to construct property regimes, physical infrastructure, and a fixed pattern of connections to render populations governable and subordinate, to extract profits on investments and to open the country to travel and the market, was a massive project of making new kinds of space and giving existing spaces new meanings, such that old urban centers became the Medina. Domestic space became a patriarchal refuge from intrusive alien ideas. In Algeria, mosques became churches, and in Morocco, conversely, mosques became places non-Muslims could not enter. It was in this process, I've argued elsewhere, from around the 1820s onwards, and very unevenly over the following century, that the divided or bifurcated Mediterranean we know today came into being. As late as the 1860s, the Ottoman statesman and Tunisian reformer Khedidin Pasha could envision his work on the constitutional government of the kingdoms of Europe, as including, in its first chapter, the Ottoman Empire. By this time, 19th century Europeans had already constructed highly exclusive understandings of their own unique place in history and the subordinate nature of other spaces to their own world historical centrality. North Africa's and North Africans' place in the world would be durably affected. These were the conditions that created Belkassim Yachim's world of coercion and evasion with which we began. There were also, of course, heavily gendered dimensions to all of this, the presence or activity of women in certain spaces, from the home to the school, the hospital and the cinema, became especially heavily overlaid with tensions about ideologies of modernity, claims to emancipation and demands for authenticity. The most intense experiences of such territorializing and the modern remaking of space came perhaps in the counterinsurgency expansion and materialization 
of the colonial state's territorial claims to sovereignty, and in the massive traumatic forced rural population resettlements that affected millions of people during the Algerian War of Independence. The achievement of independence and the re-establishment of sovereign states over newly reformulated, bordered and fixed national territories, of course, in the mid 20th century, followed and entrenched the same spatial logic. Emancipation from colonial rule meant national sovereignty, and sovereignty was territorially spatial. The reappropriation of the community's land and its resources within whose borders citizens could be equal and franchised, or subjects could be properly subject to legitimate as opposed to alien authority. In this respect, and again this is not a new claim, the emergence of nation states was the culmination of a process in spatial history begun in the 19th century of extroversion, regional fragmentation, and the triumph of outward facing connections and an extractive economy geared to the world market, as much or more as it was a return to or a reconquest of indigenous agency over the making of space. Still unfulfilled claims of revolutionary emancipation that remain in the region today can hardly escape the dominance of this same world historical pattern. Some of the troubles of the region's post-independent states would come from new trans-regional imaginaries rooted in other kinds of claims to older forms of community, especially linguistic communities, that had become ethnicized by the racial politics and political topography of the colonial era, and whose relative marginality within national boundaries and cultural politics coincided with their ability to imagine their own historical space as crossing and transcending national territorial delimitations. This is, I would argue, how we should understand the emergence not only of Berberist, but also of Islamist politics in North Africa in the last quarter of the 20th century. These dynamics too, in other words, are not predetermined by an unchanging cultural presence in the stratigraphy of the region's history, a Berber substrate or an Islamic core, and it's noticeable how often and how uncritically geological metaphors are employed in writing on these topics. They are instead, I'm suggesting, the product of recently coalescing interactions between specific people in particular places and the wider physical and ideological contexts of which they're part, as they remake their sense of the social, political and cultural spaces they live in so as to exercise agency in the world around them. Despite the obvious limits on such agency, and without in any sense romanticizing its, cap its capabilities or its likely effects, it's perhaps heartening in our present circumstances of spatial retrenchment and closure on a global scale to see the region's people once more in recent years claiming and occupying space, demonstrating their aspirations to more accountable sovereignty over it and asserting their solidarities, both with each other and with others they imagine at least, as being connected to them. So I was told we had an hour, uh, and so I've galloped through that in order to leave us some time uh, for questions and discussion. I think we have about 20 minutes for that, if anyone has any questions. Thank you very much for that fascinating talk. Uh, so the way that the questions work is if people could type their questions uh, into the chat, then both James and I will be able to see them. And then and I will sort of field them and then and ask you uh, those, James. But if people could start putting their questions into the into the chat, um, that would be fantastic. But let me start with a with a question while people are, are thinking um, of of theirs. Uh, you talked a little bit about the um, the sort of the way in which the conceptualization of, of North Africa uh, in, in antiquity is, is, is very different to, to that in, in later periods. And I wondered if you could comment a little bit on some of the terminology um, that is in the Arabic sources for the Maghreb Al-Aqsa, the Maghreb, Ifriqiya, and, and so on. Yes, yeah, so, I mean, obviously some of that terminology derives you know, from from an earlier period, so Roman Africa becomes a Phrygia, which is more or less what we know as Tunisia, um, Eastern uh, Africa, the uh, the the Maghreb Laksa, you know, the, the the furthest west is a term that that, that emerges in uh, in, in medieval uh, geography, um, Jabal Akhtar in in Cyrenaica, you know, um, uh, the, the the idea of a number of separate habitable spaces, um. Uh, that that are that are geographically discrete, distinct, that that have their own particular uh, ecologies and their own connections, often often 
you know, maritime connections rather than uh, connections over land um, is, is one that's carried over in some respects from uh, from late antiquity, at least into uh, into the medieval period. And I have to say, you know, while 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 making this this response, obviously this is not a period that I'm that I'm in any way an expert on. Um, uh, and the and so I guess the terminology reflects that, you know, that that inheritance in, in some uh, respects. Um, and and at the same time, uh, as I was suggesting, I think some of the, the 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 systemic relations between these areas are are, are really changing quite dramatically. Um, obviously, through uh, through the early Muslim period, but but not in in the ways that we were led to believe by that older colonial era uh, historiography, which read geography as kind of determining and uh, and, and obviously in you know for for, for, for Gutier and and other colonial era uh, historians uh, read uh, the Arab invasions as kind of akin to what they saw as the barbarian invasions in Europe that destroyed the Roman Empire so as, as merely destructive and, and historically uh, regressive um, the the ways in which different parts of the region came to be connected up uh, more tightly by by land so particularly in, in the case of, you know, between Western Algeria and, and Eastern Morocco, which becomes in many respects a single linguistic, uh, religio, political, cultural zone uh, over the medieval period as a frontier zone between different uh, different dynasties, uh, the Abdulwadids and the Hafsids, the, uh, the Merinids and, and, and others. Um, uh, that, that really does change the picture that 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 Glenn Shaw at least uh, presents for uh, you know the the situation that, that we see in uh, at the end of antiquity. So there are there, there are there are certainly continuities that are carried over. I think uh, uh, that we send that we see in the language, and at the same time there are some really important changes in terms of what's going on uh, in terms of the way the different parts of the region relate to each other. If that makes sense. Great, thank you. And now I, I'm, I'm going to open it up to, to the floor and so we have a question from John Mason, who uh, is wondering, in your view, to what extent did the French in the colonial period incorporate um, Arabic concepts of space, urban planning and design into their own planning and architecture of their North African colonies? Um, and he suggests that uh, Corbusier and Casablanca come to mind as one example, uh, though of course the, the, there are other ones. And he also thanks you for your presentation. That's very kind. Um, so, uh, but both, both um, to a great deal, and, and and in some very problematic ways, I think is probably the answer to that. So there are there are, there are movements in uh, French colonial architecture, um, especially for example, in the, at the very end of the nineteenth century, in the early twentieth century, a whole host of buildings that are put up. Uh, in in Algeria, uh, post offices, uh, railway stations, um, famously a a, a, a large uh, a kind of department early department store in in, in Algiers that are uh, that follow this this what they call the Moresque style. So uh, that that look like that that are supposed to look like mosques that incorporate uh, particular forms of, uh, of, of of particularly Maghrebi uh, Islamic architecture. So particular forms of arches and and, and things like that. Um, but in a very uh, in a very colonial pastiche kind of way. Um, and some of those buildings obviously uh, survive uh, and and are architecturally interesting. Uh, but whether that was, a, I, mean, I think we we needed to see that as a uh, as something of a kind of pastiche appropriation rather than as a kind of serious way of uh, incorporating indigenous Arabic or or, or or Muslim forms of architecture into colonial uh, planning. Um, we do later on see uh, attempts made to adopt what French colonial planners and architects at least thought were uh, local ideas of the organization of space into things like uh, new housing projects that are put up towards the very end of the colonial period as part of slum clearance projects. Um, when when uh, in the 1950s and uh, uh, the very, very end of the Algerian war in the 1960-61, um, uh, there were attempts made to rehouse populations out of shanty towns. Some of the uh, new uh, housing that, that that's put up that's, uh, that 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 is 
part of the kind of late colonial states development project at that stage is starting to very explicitly reflect on uh, indigenous ways of organizing space, uh, the courtyard house, uh, the, uh, the 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 way in which uh, people might prefer to live. Um, I mean that goes alongside some some really coercive um, and, uh, and and obviously uh, you know very uh, very violent processes at, at, at the same time. Uh, so it's it, it's difficult to again to 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 see that outside of its uh, it, its its larger context, which of course is. Is very problematic in, in all kinds of ways, but there are there are the, you know, even when they're when they're engaging in, in these resettlement programs that I that I mentioned uh, towards the end, um, you know we have these kind of Roman grid plans as you can see in this picture on the, the on, on the left, the Oled uh, which is a resettlement camp in uh, near in, in in the region of Oran. Um, there's this idea that early on the French are very frequently using these kinds of Roman military. Uh, grid plans uh, to design uh, these kinds of resettlement projects. Uh, and, and it's very obviously with a with a military uh, uh, you know, end in, in view and also a, a particular model of, uh, even at this late stage, you know, 1960, uh, a particular model of French colonialism as, as some kind of reimposing an earlier form of, of, of Latinate order on uh, the North African countryside. Um, uh, and at the same time, when uh, these camps were then inspected uh, and uh, people were beginning to think about how they might turn these resettlement projects into development villages as part of a modernization drive, which happens towards the end of the war, um, they start to say things like, well, you know, the peasants who are coming down from the mountains prefer to live in uh, in a different style, in uh, in closer agglomerations of smaller numbers of, uh, of, of of houses that are shared between different families and so on, um, and they begin to, to to try to take those things into into account. So th this is something that that runs through uh, French thinking, uh, both in Morocco and in Algeria, rather differently in Morocco, where there's a, a, a very you know much more explicit, um, overt set of ideas about preserving. Uh, urban patrimony and, and 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 the built environment and the heritage of that, um, one which again you know is 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 very problematic in all kinds of ways. And Jennifer Blugod's book back in the early eighties, uh, you know, uh, laid out uh, a kind of indictment against that as having created you know kind of form of urban social apartheid in the way that space was organised in, in places like that or, or, or fairs of Casablanca. Um, uh, but there's an engagement uh, all all the time, I think. Uh, sometimes in quite interesting ways, but 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 always in uh, within a, a logic that was that was that was you know ultimately fundamentally coercive, and uh, and, and and that always shows through, I think. Thanks. We've got some other questions from from the floor. So this is a question from Arthur Asaraf, who who says so this is a question about internal differences. Um, as you know, he's very interested in a person similar to Yakim, and he's mm. been surprised in writing, um, in the writing of the time, that the Sahara and Sudan were not considered familiar to people in Tunis or Algiers. And he wonders how do we deal um, with how different kinds of North Africans, whether they be coastal, mountainous, desert, Muslims, Jews, high class, etc., um, how, how these different North Africans understood this space and how we manage that. That's a great question, um, and uh, I hope that Arthur's forthcoming book will tell us more about it. Um, uh, uh, that's a, so that's a very good question. I mean, you know, the region the region itself is, uh, as I as I tried to say, um, uh, made up to the extent that we can talk about it as a coherent region by the shifting connections between its different constituent parts. And those ebb and flow and expand and contract and move and change shape over time. Uh, and that's what's interesting about uh, thinking in these terms, at least in the way that I've tried to, to, to lay it out, uh, uh, obviously very in you know, extremely broad brush terms. Um, and, and yes, I mean, I think that there are, there are obviously uh, long-standing connections uh, between certain parts of Saharan space and certain parts of uh, of, of space in, in the mountains and the plains and the cities further north, you know, between the Mizab, obviously, um, and say Tunis and Algiers and across the Sahara to the south, um, 
across certain uh, oasis chains uh, in, uh, in in the Gurara, for example, or uh, in uh, in the Tuet, um, uh, across uh, the Fezzan from Libya down towards Lake Chad, um, and 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 those are, you know, th those are kind of discrete. Again seasonally dependent uh fluctuating units uh where knowledge is exchanged and and uh, people are more or less continually in touch with each other over a very very long period of time uh colonial authorities found this find this very difficult to to read very difficult to understand and of course the our difficulty in accessing any of this uh is multiplied many times over by the difficulties in the uh, uh, emergence of information about space that different people were able to give to other people at different times. So Arthur's um, uh, project on uh, uh, his, his chap Jubadi, who is exactly, exactly kind of uh, uh, located in these, uh, in, in the, and meshed in, in these networks of, uh, of information and the withholding of information is a good example of that. Um, Camille Lefebvre's work on uh, informers, uh, the informants of um, colonial map making uh, in uh, the Sahel and the Southern Sahara uh, is another good example of that. Um, uh, and, and, and so in brief, it's difficult, I think it's really difficult for us to get any clear sense of exactly uh who 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 knew or understood what about where at different times you know we get it when we look very closely at very localized often manuscript sources um uh the kind of work that ismail watch who, who i mentioned earlier is doing for the early modern period in the Tuat, for example can tell us quite a lot about that but but our, our sources are necessarily very fragmentary so it's difficult to, to say anything in uh in, in in broader terms i think what's what's really interesting is exactly that uh the persistence of those internal differences right the persistence of um the fragmentation and and at the same time uh the ways in which over time the different fragments of the region change in their relations to each other but at certain times there's more uh intensity of connection and at other times those connections you know uh, abate and 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 disappear um and the on the one hand you know the, the idea that the the Sahara and the Sudan were unfamiliar to people in Tunis or Algiers is obviously a function of colonial ignorance. Um, and at the same time, you know, uh, it's it, it it just it tells us something about the the shifting nature of those connections over time, which were anything but stable. And another another question, um, which takes us more to the modern contemporary architecture. So this is a question from Elizabeth Fentress. Do you see a refusal on the part of modern Maghrebi architects to build anything that looks folkloric? Uh, because the various buildings in Algerian cities, for example, are, are anything but. Uh, so I'm no expert on uh, architecture at all uh, and uh first Fentress probably knows a lot more about it than i do um but yes i think so i think there's something very interesting more recently uh in algeria certainly um in terms of the desire to put up buildings especially more recently especially privately funded buildings especially for example local mosque architecture is really interesting uh uh that is uh deliberately modern in a very uh, non be specific way, right? So I think there is uh, something interesting in the uh, desire, certainly not to replicate anything that um, is an, at all uh, redolent of that colonial era kind of Moresque style of architecture that I mentioned earlier. Um, but also, yes, the, anything that's kind of, you know, what, what is folkloric is, is generally seen na now, I think, you know, certainly in, in Algeria. I'm not sure if, if it's the same in, in Morocco and, and, and maybe not in Tunisia either. And I don't know anything about Libya um, uh, in this respect. Uh, but there is a, a, a sense, I think, that the folkloric is basically rural and backward and uh, not to be uh, uh, promoted. And, and I think that goes back 
in the Algerian case to uh, a series of you know um, disputes over cultural politics that go back to the national nationalist movement that go back to the 1950s uh, and before even. Um, uh, if you look at the way that people in Kabylia build their houses, now nobody builds Bourdieu's Kabyle house anymore. That doesn't exist. Um, in fact, they're, 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 they're vanishingly few and far between. Uh, houses built with remittances from workers uh, that are sent home from France look very, very different. Uh, everybody wants to look at live in something that looks like a, a villa. It's poured concrete and, uh, and steel frame. Um, people who build neighborhood mosques in uh, the, in, if you walk walk around any part of, uh, of Algiers, at least, uh, you know, as I was regularly about 10 years ago, um, uh, mosques look increasingly Middle Eastern in style. Right? Everybody wants to have a kind of Turkish or Saudi looking uh, mosque. Nobody builds a mosque with a square minuet. Uh, there's the, the, those kinds of uh, uh, styles are very, very noticeable by their, by their absence. Um, so I think there is a sense that, the, again, you know, this is interesting, right? So the, 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 the the larger cultural um, and symbolic uh, universes and the ways that people want to tie themselves into those through their action in the built environment um, are those of, of the Middle East, of Southeast Asia, of Saudi Arabia, of Turkey, um, uh, not of uh, the Maghreb, uh, not, of, not, of, not of a kind of, uh, you know, uh, harking back to an internal indigenous Maghrebi uh, architectural uh, inheritance. Uh, I think that I think that poorly is true. And uh, now we have we have a couple more questions, so I'll try and fit them in before we have to, to close today. So this is from Hannah Louise Clark, uh, who's from Glasgow, yeah. um, and she thanks you for your wonderful talk and is very interested to hear more about the Makans and the different kinds of local, regional, trans-regional sources, but not those in French, um, that exist for learning about what happens um, at them. So she's particularly uh. interested in places where people go to seek healing, so that's where her question's coming from. Yes, that's a great question. I wish I knew. I'd love to know more about that. So Berk writes about this actually. Um, back in uh, in in the, in the sixties and seventies, I think there's some some stuff by Berk about how uh, uh, kubas in particular, so little saints mausoleums, rather than makams, which mark the passing of more famous saints through different parts of the of the region, um, uh, become uh, popular places for veneration and kind of therapeutic practice again after independence having ceased to be such during the war of independence in, in the case of Algeria um, uh, I mean it would be really interesting to know more about this uh, for, for, for for Morocco as well for rural areas in Morocco where I suspect it's much more common I don't I don't know nearly enough about it uh, I, I, again I suspect also it's something that that you'd have to do really really specific local uh, ethnographic research uh, to find out about. Um, in terms of what sources there are, uh, the ones that I know are usually, uh, you know, the, the denunciations of those kinds of things that emerge in the press uh, and publication, the writings of Islamic reformists in the 1920s and 30s and, and, and 40s, um, where these are the kinds of practices that people are trying to stamp out, precisely because they're feminized, they're connected, they're, they're, they're associated with women, and they're associated with backward rural uh, forms of, uh, of uh, you know, not true Islam, as it were. So uh, I, I'd love to know more about those things, uh, but I don't. So I think we have one time for one more question. So I apologise to those whose questions haven't been um, answered, but unfortunately we don't have time for everything. Uh, but this last question is from Mohamed Awaldi, who says that you clearly show how during the colonial era, uh, colonial authorities played a major role in the ethnicisation of populations and the delimitation of spaces. But one could say that these processes started during the early modern period, including the distinction between the four components of the Maghreb and as well as some mm. process of racialization. So the question is, what differences would you make between the colonial processes of ethnicization and spatial delimitations and those occurring in the Maghreb during the early modern period? Uh, that's a really good question uh, and ought to have anticipated it from Hamad who uh, has done lots of work on why we need not to focus on the colonial period nearly as much as we do and to think about the early modern period as well uh, and uh, obviously has a good point in uh, in, in insisting on that so uh, so look you know I'm I'm speaking from from my own uh, areas of greatest knowledge which is to say the 19th and 20th centuries and I'm sure though that certainly so from the from the 16th and 17th centuries onwards as we have you know um, increasingly effective uh, territorial sovereignty, at least in the case of Tunisia, right, certainly, uh, 
uh, under the Hussainids and also uh, to a certain degree at least and, and, and at some times in the case of Algeria across the three uh, the three Beyliks, um, uh rather less in the case of Morocco right until until uh, uh, until the 19th century um, that sense of delimitation and bordering certainly certainly does happen uh, before the Europeans show up and I think it, it starts to happen in much more uh, intense ways. Uh, in the 19th century and from the, and from, from the, from the colonial and the colonial period and, uh, and, and, and onwards. Um, uh, you know, that, 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 that's kind of illustrated by the relationship between Eastern Algeria and Tunis, between the Constantine, between Constantine and Tunis, right, which, which is, is conflictual um, and distinct, uh, but also, uh, also quite 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 closely connected, right? So when Ahmed Bey, the, the ruler of Constantine in the 1830s, um, retires his troops from from Algiers, giving up on on the the Turkish the, the Ottoman attempt to, to keep the French out, and instead fortifies his position in the east of the country. Um, he he seeks an accommodation with the with with the uh, the Bay of Tunis to the east, um, and continues to you know assert his own sovereignty in the name of the Ottoman Sultan. Um, as as the, the ruler of a distinct area um, that is closer in that respect to, to 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 Tunis than it is to Algiers, which of course is commercially and you know, in some ways linguistically and also um, politically uh, and geographically, uh, you know, make makes sense. Um, so there's 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 more uh, fluidity still in in that respect, I think, right up until the middle of the nineteenth century than, than we might suppose. And I, and I, and I don't I, I wouldn't want to see um, a kind of uh, inevitable genealogy of the modern state uh, in the shape of the early modern uh, political contours of the region, um, except maybe for the case of Tunisia, where it probably is stronger uh, than, than anywhere else. Um, in terms of ethnicization, I think that's that's really interesting. Uh, the uh, the relationship between language communities and what become racialized as ethnic groups, um, I think, is a really interesting one. I think it's uh, it, it, it's something that is uh, very very heavily impacted by colonial uh, governmentality, uh, and in the earlier period, it's, the picture is much more confusing uh, and, uh, and and governed by different sets of hierarchies. Right. So I suppose this is sorry, I'm taking a very long time to get to an answer to this question, but I suppose the the way I would see the differences um, is that the the that there is of course already a set of hierarchies. You know, there are local uh, hierarchies of, of kind of racialized population groups all over the region. Uh, long before Europeans show up and start creating kind of ethnic and racial uh, hierarchies that we know and that, and that, that exist today. Um, uh, and those respond to much kind of finer grained local sets of hierarchy, it seems to me, um, uh, that that, that have to do with the division of labor, that have to do with social prestige, that have to do with marriage alliances, uh, that have to do with, you know, the, the, the very particular local narratives of, of uh, genealogical origin, where you come from and how long you've been established in this particular place and who you marry your daughters to and to whom you do not marry your daughters, things like that. Um, and and, and they're, they're, they're much more locally determined, I think, than they are um, kind of imposed by you know the, the the armature of what becomes the modern state: the bureaucracy, the census, the the the, um, the identity cards, the, um, the 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 map of the tribes, the Karatan Vanya that I showed earlier, or the the, the delimitation of Berberophone areas. Um, uh, so so I, I think those things are more localized, more fluid, um, and uh, respond to more local demands probably in terms of uh, distribution of power and hierarchy in, in the early modern period than they do in, in the modern period. But I, again, that's something we need to know more about, I think. Thank you very much. Uh, we now have time, but a, a couple of people, James, were asking if you could put your final slide up with the references. Oh, yes. Again, before we... Uh... Sorry, so yes, I did put the references in uh, so that anyone could see them if they need them, but I can also email those to anybody who wants them. If you, need, if you want the references, email me and I can send them. Off.
That's very kind. So I think, uh, sadly, we can't all applaud you uh, in person or have a nice drink afterwards. Um, but thank you very much for, for giving us this fascinating talk. It's been a great pleasure to host you and we hope to be able to host you in person at some point uh, in the future. Uh, but for now, this is this is the we'll, we'll be closing the, the seminar now. Um, but for those of you interested in hearing more about North Africa, in January and February, we have uh, events lined up on the Garamantes and the Libyan Fazan, um, as well as the Marinids of Morocco. Uh, so join us, sign up for our mailing list uh, to hear about uh, all of these, but otherwise the Society wishes you um, a welcome break, hopefully with your friends and family, um, and to see you all in the new year. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'm going to end the call now. Take care, everyone.